In the most enigmatic corners of history, where whispers of mystery and legend intertwine, lies a figure who defies time and human understanding, the Count of Saint-Germain. Who was this mysterious individual who seemed to float through the centuries, leaving a trail of intrigue, occult knowledge and an aura of mysticism? Welcome to a captivating journey through the enigmatic existence of this extraordinary character. In the pages of this text, Connie Mendez invites you to uncover the secrets woven into the life of someone who transcended conventional limits, showcasing extraordinary skills and wisdom that challenged the norms of his time. From the royal courts of Europe to the most secluded esoteric circles, the Count of Saint-Germain's figure has been crafted from threads of both legend and reality. Was he an immortal alchemist, a master political strategist, a prodigious occultist, or merely a myth embellished by the passage of time? Prepare to delve into a narrative that unravels the enigmas surrounding this enigmatic individual, exploring his alleged immortality, his mastery of various arts, his influence in the corridors of power, and his enduring legacy. Join Connie Mendez on an unprecedented journey into the mysterious life of the Count of Saint-Germain, a man cloaked in mystery and magic whose existence defies the passage of time. Was he truly among us, or is he the personification of a legend that challenges the boundaries of reality? Immerse yourself in this narrative and discover the secrets that have fascinated generations throughout history. Introduction In this modest work, the author does not claim to hold the ultimate truth about the Count of Saint-Germain or the Ascended Master Saint-Germain, both being the same person. The goal is to clarify, as much as possible, some mysteries that have persisted in people's minds since the Count's disappearance in the 18th century, and to communicate certain revelations entrusted to us, which you will discover at the end of the book. These clarifications and revelations are of great value for completing the metaphysical teachings for the new era that have been transmitted to us by the Master Saint-Germain himself. At the end, you will also find an extensive bibliography on this enigmatic character, but the author advises caution in the indiscriminate acceptance of everything that has been written about him at a time when spiritual truth was largely misunderstood, unlike what we know today. Indeed, those memoir and biography writers, hungry for sensationalism, based their accounts on their positions, conjectures and personal opinions all products of the carnal mind. The adept always came to spiritualize medieval Europe, to try to prevent the great development of negative influences that almost paralyzed the planet Earth. However, this has been completely ignored until now by the vast majority of humanity. It is only with the full knowledge of the law of mentalism and the action of the violet flame that human consciousness rises to climb the initiatory ladder where we now find ourselves. We are already venturing into the orbit of uranium and entering the presence of the I Am. Part 1. Who is and who was the Count of Saint-Germain? Chapter 1. Much has been written about the fabulous, enigmatic and mysterious Count of Saint-Germain, this wonderful man who dominated the European scene in the 17th and 18th centuries. Official archives, state documents and foreign affairs records from all over Europe are filled with references to the Count, and after his disappearance, many novels and memoirs emerged, the first inspired by this prodigious character, among which stand out the most famous such as Zanoni by Edward Bulwer-Lytton, The Count of Monte Cristo by Alexandre dumas père and The Scarlet Pimpernel by Baroness Orchi. Two currents surrounded the Count, one of jealousy and envy because he enjoyed the trust and admiration of the kings, sages, and most eminent statesmen of Europe, the other current, imbued with deep respect and affection, involved esoteric orders, secret societies and occultist sects everywhere. The first current sought to bring him down, to imprison and exile him wherever he went, labelling him a traitor or even a charlatan, without ever being caught in an act of treason against the trust placed in him, nor were his great riches extracted from those with whom he made contact. All efforts to investigate the source of his resources proved unsuccessful. He did not use banks or bankers, but operated within a sphere of unlimited credit that was never questioned by others nor abused by himself, 
Attempts to capture him always failed. The Count would slip away and disappear mysteriously, only to reappear immediately in a different country. Subsequent writings, which still exist today, fail to explain a single word of the enigmas and mysteries surrounding the Count, as everything is based on conjecture, supposition, and opinions of human consciousness, without a hint of esoteric or spiritual knowledge. The simple truth about the Count of Saint-Germain is that he was enlightened, an adept, a special envoy of the white hierarchy, to accomplish multiple missions with countless obligations. History blindly repeats that he was born on May 26, 1696, son of the last ruler of Transylvania, Ferenc II, and Princess Charlotte Amélie of hesse rheinfels He was said to have been born in the Rakotsi Castle in the Carpathian Mountains, pursued by Charles VI, who had dethroned his father. Ferenc II sought to protect his son, the prince, and after spreading the false news of the child's death, he sent him under the guardianship of Gian Gastone, the last of the Medicis in Florence. The prince was a very intelligent and spiritually advanced young man. At the age of 14, he distinguished himself in the Italian Masonic movement while pursuing his studies at the University of Siena. His father was a patriot highly appreciated by his people, but was exiled to Rodosto in Turkey, where he was surrounded by a small court until his death in 1735. The prince went to the bedside of his dying father, then was sent by the Sultan on a diplomatic mission to Transylvania. Little is known about the prince during these years. Hungarian history does not treat him sympathetically, labelling him the son of a German woman who never lived in Hungary, having grown up far from the Rakosi tradition as a stranger in his father's village. In the same year, it also attributes his premature death for a second time. It is important for the student to notice all the apparent contradictions to absorb what the evidence suggests, even if the prince, despite being spiritually advanced, never gave any proof of the faculties he would later display. However, in 1735 upon his father's death, strange manoeuvres began to emerge from the people and the court of Hungary, sparking discussions and questions with no possible explanation for the witnesses. For example, at the very moment when Ferenc II, his son, the Prince Rakotsi, died, he was seen in the Netherlands, contacting Sirloin Rosicrucian, a prominent figure and president of the Roger Society of London. While the Sultan used him in Turkey, the Prince was a guest of the Shah of Persia. The Prince historically and publicly died a year after his father, when events might have linked him to an official life in Hungary. Hardly deceased in Turkey or Transylvania, he mysteriously appeared in Scotland, where he lived until 1745. From there, he went to Germany and Austria for industrial missions, then left to study alchemy in India. He did not reappear until 1758, establishing contact with Marshal de Belle Isle of the French army, but throughout these years, he acted under the names of Marquis de Montferrat, Count Bellemare, Knight Schoen, Knight Webton, Monsieur de Surmont, and Count Sotikoff. The time had come for him to begin his mission in Paris, and he introduced himself to Marshal de Belle Isle as the Count of Saint-Germain. Marshal Belle Isle brought him to Paris, introduced him to Madame de Pompadour, who in turn introduced him to the King of France, and that is when the bewildering magic of the Count of Saint-Germain began to unfold. He disappeared forever. Prince Rakotsi, though history says he asserted before the king to justify his noble lineage, details of his birth and origins, which were immediately accepted by his majesty. Chapter 2. Prince Rakotsi was born in 1696. When he arrived in Paris in 1758, he was 62 years old, but appeared to be only 30. The world saw him as a young and noble lord, with exquisite manners, great dignity, and impeccable courtesy. He had a military bearing, was slender and of medium height. His body was astonishingly well-formed, his hands delicate, his feet small, his movements elegant. His hair was dark and fine, his eyes brown. One of his biographers, the Countess of Adamar, repeatedly said, What eyes I have never seen the like. Everything about him seemed to belong to a very old and noble family. He dressed soberly, with impeccable tailoring and the finest fabrics. He always wore very fine silk stockings. By the magnificence of his jewellery, he was considered immensely wealthy. 
There were whispers about his unlimited credit in all the banks of the world and the lavish lifestyle he led. It was said that he had two footmen and four uniformed lackeys in tobacco-coloured attire with gold trim. People talked about his large collection of vests, which he changed often, and his buttons, pins, watches, rings and chains. They mentioned a monstrous opal and an extraordinary white sapphire the size of an egg, as well as the variety of his diamonds, their size, colour and perfection. Yet, strangely, no one could boast of having been received in the Count's house. He attended parties, but no one had ever seen him eat or drink. The Count of Saint-Germain displayed an unchanging constancy, refinement and culture characteristic of nobles of rank and education. This was combined with fascinating conversation, an ability to change tone and subject that made him always refreshing, unexpected and inexhaustible. He gave the impression of having travelled the entire world and especially of having personally witnessed everything that existed on our planet. The Count was undoubtedly a fortunate diplomat, an artistic genius, an excellent musician and composer who played the piano masterfully, rivalled Paganini on the violin, sang with a beautiful baritone voice, painted and sculpted like the greats, and apparently lived eternally since, according to his own words, his discovery of a special liquid had kept him alive for two thousand years in London, at Walsh's house on Catherine Street in 1740. The Count published several compositions, but we only know of one, an aria from his little opera La Perte and Constante, composed in the Rococo style of the 18th century, very beautiful and very ornate. Finally, we provide the address where the record of this piece can be obtained, which also has the appeal and confirmation of starting with the tonal notes of the adept, the ascended master Saint-Germain, C.F., of the fifth octave of the keyboard. Let us clarify once and for all the reason for this adept's choice of name for this mission. It stands to reason that for an intelligent man to introduce himself into the brightest court in Europe, a nice name and a French noble title, preferably authentic and indisputable, were indispensable, the latter having to withstand any investigation. It is said that the estates of Racoxi's friends in Italy were called de Saint-Germain. We cannot confirm or verify this, but there is some certainty about it, for the masters, having the privilege of looking from the distant past to the present, do so personally equipped with all necessary preparation. His business card had to open the doors of sovereign courts and even the highest spiritual organizations which have eyes to see and ears to hear. We have already seen how the Count of Saint-Germain came and went as Count Yernemaitas. He spoke the esoteric language of all sects, meaning that comes comito, or comitor, is a high Masonic rank. Sanctus appeals to Christian religions, and yernamitus, or fraternity, is the sign of all occultists entering French Freemasonry where he began. Diderot announced that he was the oldest of all Masons, not to say that he had been the very founder of the order. Master Saint-Germain did not need to choose another name to continue his missions for humans, for gradually this name was transforming according to the change in spiritual consciences from member of the white fraternity to elder brother. We neither assume nor invent when we assert that Prince Racozzi and the Count of Saint-Germain were one and the same person. The masters confirmed this when, through the Theosophical Society, founded by Masters Moria and Kuthumi, the following communication arrived via the Tibetan adept of the White Brotherhood almost a century after the Count of Saint-Germain's death. The master primarily responsible for the future development of Europe and the mental expansion of America is Master Rakotsi. He is Hungarian and resides in the Carpathian Mountains, having once been a well-known figure at the Hungarian court. There is also much discussion about him when he was the Count of Saint-Germain in the Lodge of the White Brotherhood, where he is usually called the Count, and in America, he acts as the general administrator in the plans of the Great Brothers. It can be said that he is responsible for putting into practice, on the physical plane, the plans of Christ for any reader between the lines of this communication. It speaks clearly, but as we are here to clarify the enigmas, we emphasize that the mental expansion of America refers to the principle of mentalism, which, although given by Hermes Trismegistus, did not receive the paramount importance it contains until Mary Baker Eddy, founder of Christian Science, began to divulge it. She was the herald of the coming age, 
the age of the woman at the end of the 19th century, representing the mental principle that governs this era. The communication speaks of Master Rakotsi in the present, present on the planet, even though he is historically dead. The master responsible for him is also said to be Hungarian and resides in the Carpathians, having once been a well-known figure at the Hungarian court. He indeed admits that he was simultaneously the Count of Saint-Germain and mentions that he was much talked about. The essence of the communication asserts that Prince Rakotsi was called the Count in the White Brotherhood, merging the two entities without concealment. Then he admits that the Count is the instrument of the Ascendant Cohort on the American continent and finally hints at what, at the date of the communication, had not yet been revealed, namely that Master Saint-Germain would be the avatar of this Aquarian age, bringing to practice on the physical plane the Christ of the age, as he manifested in the immediately preceding age with Master Jesus. The adepts do not need to reincarnate to circulate on earth and among humans. If they need to enter our atmosphere for a short period, they make their ethereal bodies dense, and consequently visible to our physical eyes. If they must carry out a long-term mission, say a few months or years, they use a borrowed body, which requires much less energy than the previous system. It is totally impractical to be reborn from a woman's womb, to return with an enveloped consciousness and no memory, and in addition to have to wait so many years to reach adulthood and be able to accomplish an important mission. Transfiguration, that is, the occupation of a borrowed body, is the transfer of a spirit or ego into the body of an initiate willing to yield their body while alive or at the moment of their death. This body must be absolutely healthy, and the ego inhabiting it must be advanced, as the high vibrations of the spirit that will occupy it are very strong. The transfer is done gradually. It can be assumed that the master occupied the body of the prince at those moments when he was declared dead. It is possible that he appeared thus to those around him. It would not be strange for the master to have feigned his death, as we know he did so on two other occasions. The adept who occupies a borrowed body has all the power to reform the atomic structure of this body to suit their own needs. For this reason, the Count of Saint-Germain had no need to eat or drink as he had the universal substance that instantly and unconditionally obeyed a master's orders. Master Saint-Germain himself admitted to having occupied about forty borrowed bodies on different occasions and for various purposes omitted on earth. We know that one of these was the body of Saint Joseph, husband of the Virgin Mary, the most delicate and mysterious mission. After more than two thousand years, the complete truth is still unknown. Another occupation of a borrowed body was that of Admiral Christopher Columbus, destined to discover the new world announced by Master Jesus without getting lost or shipwrecked, where so many new dimensions and consciousnesses were to develop. We know from an ancestor of this author, a close friend and travelling companion of Columbus, that they were both occultists, which suggests they both possessed an advanced level of knowledge. Columbus could very well have lent his body to the adept, who led him to success in his voyages while carrying out the plans of the White Hierarchy, as evidenced by the planetary archives of Royal Teton in North America and Machu Picchu in South America. A third occupation seems to have been that of the liberator Simon Bolivar, for Master Saint-Germain's actions have always been in favour of the liberation of human beings, nations, ideas and souls. This feat of Bolivar, despite all the glory and importance it is given and deserved, has not been fully accepted. Climbing the snowy peaks of the Andes without paths, without weapons or professional soldiers, was a series of miracles characteristic of the Count of Saint-Germain and Master Saint-Germain, Chapter 3. The entire world was astounded by the extraordinary memory of the Count of Saint-Germain. He could recite entire pages after a simple glance. He spoke German, English, Italian, Portuguese, Spanish, French, Greek, Latin, Arabic, Chinese, Hebrew, Chaldean, Syriac, Sanskrit, and many Oriental dialects without an accent, and he read Babylonian cuneiform and Egyptian hieroglyphs all with complete mastery. The Count was ambidextrous, able to write with both hands simultaneously. Both halves of his brain were independent. He could write a sonnet with one hand and a love letter with the other, although he never flaunted his hidden powers. The Count spontaneously acted as a white magician, 
a Kabbalist, a Hermeticist, an Alchemist, an Illuminist, a Templar, a Gnostic, a Freemason, and a Rosicrucian. He was clairvoyant, clairaudient, travelled astrally, ethereally, cosmically. Sometimes he was not seen for three days, entering a deep trance without awakening. This could happen at his home or someone else's. The Viennese historian Franz Jaffred recounts that one day, in the middle of a conversation with the Count, he suddenly saw him become serious, rigid as a statue. His usually expressive eyes became lifeless and colourless. Shortly after, he revived, stood up, and making a farewell gesture with his hand, exclaimed in German, I am leaving, you will see me once more tomorrow. I am needed in Constantinople, then in England. For now I must prepare two inventions that you will see in the next century, a boat and a train. He had the disconcerting habit of entering the king's chamber without passing through the doors. He simply appeared and disappeared without hiding his ability. At meetings he entertained by recounting details of his connections with Cleopatra, with Jesus Christ, with the Queen of Sheba, with Saint Isabel, with the courts of several kingdoms, with Santa Anna, with ancient Rome, with Russia, Turkey, Austria, China, Japan, India. Sometimes he imitated Francis I, other times he revealed high-placed secrets of Louis XIV, and he spoke with more confidence than the official representative of each character could have. Once, while recounting a very ancient episode, he stopped with a slight look of confusion and said to his standing footman, That's how it was, wasn't it, Roger? And Roger replied, Count, you forget that I am only four hundred years old. It must have happened during my predecessor's time. This brings us to ask where to place Roger concerning the theory of birth at Rakoxy Castle. Of course, all these prodigies are catalogued by ordinary humanity in terms of white or black magic, depending on whether it is good or bad. But since everything has a perfectly natural explanation and human beings inherit the same right bequeathed by the Divine Creator Father, it would be good to clarify the mystery of each of the preceding enigmas. When a human being reaches their last incarnation on Earth, they are said to be a candidate for ascension. Ascension occurs because the person has detached themselves from all attachments to planet Earth and their loved ones and has managed to purify themselves of all negative energy, filling their cells with light. Then comes the moment when the mighty presence I Am draws them to it and removes them from Earth. Earth's gravity is overcome at that moment. The individual then has the opportunity to choose glory or to continue helping their fellow humans. This is the moment when the subconscious empties its contents and the ego remembers all its past incarnations without feeling any discomfort, also recovering all its acquired skills and all the languages spoken throughout its lives. They can then access their treasures in heaven, that is, everything contained in their causal body. But if the ego prefers to ascend to glory, they must give up everything they have accumulated for the good of humanity. The extraordinary memory is nothing more than the natural faculty of looking back and reading like a book or seeing like a movie. Everything that comes to mind from the past without the veil of Maya. Being ambidextrous is nothing more than having been left-handed in other lives, an acquired skill so the individual can write with both hands. The ability to appear and disappear without passing through doors is a condition of the astral and etheric bodies, Knowing how to project them out of the physical body can be accomplished through study and practice during the physical body's life. The physical body is left to sleep in a bed during the journey. It is very useful to know that by focusing on a place or a person, one is there or with them. As for Roger, he might be the most consistent proof that they both occupied borrowed bodies at that time. Roger manifested as an initiated student and inseparable servant of the Master. Chapter 4. The problem of money is one of humanity's major concerns. In all chronicles concerning the Count, a great curiosity is shown about the sources of the sums he apparently spent on his sumptuous jewels to finance his life at court and dress so nobly. Without the spiritual knowledge taught by the I Am activity, the only answer left is alchemy. The world labelled him an alchemist and looked no further. The law of correspondence says that what is above is like what is below and vice versa. Alchemy exists on all planes. However, as we discover in all this, things become simpler, lighter, and faster. 
as one progresses on the spiritual plane, and conversely, they become heavier, more delayed, and more laborious as one descends on the material plane. The transformation of metals into gold is identical to the transmutation of energy on the mental spiritual plane. It is simply converting negative and destructive mental forms and images into the pure gold of virtues that belong to us on the I am plane. Cicero said that philosophy is the knowledge of divine and human things as well as their causes and principles. Apply this duality to the idea of the philosopher's stone that transmutes metals into gold and you will see very clearly that it is nothing more than a completely abstract state of things and nothing physical. The stone, as we know in metaphysics, is faith. Philosophy is pure, exact wisdom, the sharp edge of the blade. Alchemy is thus first spiritual and very lastly material, but one cannot learn from the bottom up. Whoever knows how to transmute energy through the means of the violet flame first, then through the means of the other flames, has found the philosopher's stone. They will gradually transform the accumulation of energy that prevents them from manifesting the gold of abundance in their life. Generally, alchemists were very wise beings, very versed in the most occult sciences. The Kabbalistic signs they used were very profound formulas and equations. Their speeches were veiled so that novices would not start experimenting with dangerous circumstances, as the curious read and give a totally erroneous interpretation to what they read, especially concerning anything spiritual, as they follow only the dead letter. It is true that in the eyes of Giacomo Casanova de Sangalt, the Count took a twelve-cent coin, exposed it to a certain flame until it became red, then after it cooled, handed it back to Casanova. He was so astonished to find it was pure gold that he expressed doubt that Saint-Germain might have exchanged the coin for another. The Count simply replied, He who doubts my knowledge does not deserve to speak with me, and then showed him the door. For a being of the stature of Count Saint-Germain all possibilities exist. An initiate, an adept, a master of such magnitude encounters no difficulty in transforming a cent into a gold coin when it suffices to extend the hand and extract from the air the gold needed. This truth can only be believed and understood by those who have become aware of the principle of mentalism up to the point of becoming aware, because it has been completely ignored until the last century. The world was filled with alchemists, seeking gold by the easy path, ignoring the truth. We are already at the level where many will realize the fact that, if they visualize themselves in the golden flame, descending from the presence and feel gratitude for it, they will soon precipitate all the necessary substance. This is a step in spiritual alchemy and cannot fail. A vital point must be clarified, without which spiritual alchemy does not work. The I Am Presence cannot bring down its golden substance to the lower ego unless the channel is clean. Clean means not obstructed by bitterness. This bitterness is formed by criticism, gossip, ill will, resentment, constant remembrance of past wrongs, violent emotions. The most practical way to have a balanced mind at all times is to strive not to be affected by any hurtful or impatient circumstance. Keep your joy and good humor. For any loss of patience, any consideration for error will be largely charged to you. Not only because it affects your receptivity to the good your I am presence wants to give you, but also because when you reach these heights of spiritual alchemy, your mood changes and emotional fluctuations destructively affect your entire environment, your family, and your relationships. And if you are a group leader, it affects your entire group. It is better not to attend where sad, negative, and dramatic events occur. And for a person at this stage, it is not necessary to visit the sick, nor to make passes by placing hands, nor to come into direct contact with any problem. The universal treatment of I am reaches all latitudes. It must be done at a distance, for often, the practitioner will find their vibrations are too strong for the sick. Chapter 5 Charles, Duke of Shelby, related to Prince Rakosi through his mother, Princess of Hesraifels, was a highly advanced occultist, an intimate friend of the Count, and perhaps the only one who knew the whole truth about him. The death of Count Saint-Germain at Duke Charles's castle in Etchenford, Sweden, on February 27, 1784, is as false as his birth in Transylvania. 
but this wasn't the first time the master had disappeared, without leaving a grave or a tombstone, as we will see later. Voltaire said something in a letter to Frederick the Great. Count Saint-Germain is the man who never dies and who knows everything. Duke Charles burned all the Count's papers after his disappearance, leaving only the manuscript of the very holy philosophy, the only book he wrote. Madame Lavasky, intrigued, commented in the Theosophical Society two centuries later, asserting that it is not absurd that a man as famous as Saint-Germain was buried without pomp or ceremony, without official supervision or police record, which always occurs during the funerals of men of rank. Where are these records? There are neither papers nor records containing them. Add to this the fact that the Count was seen several times after 1784, during a very important private conference with Queen Catherine of Russia in 1785, appearing to Princess Lamballe shortly before she was beheaded. He also appeared to Jane du Barry, the King's mistress, while she waited on the scaffold during the Days of Terror in 1793. Ah. Count de Chalon claimed to have conversed with Saint-Germain in 1788 in St. Mark's Square in Venice, the night before his departure for France. In the 20th century, around the 1920s, Bishop Lean Better of the Liberal Catholic Church, while walking in Rome, met Master Saint-Germain dressed as an Italian nobleman, and they conversed for over an hour. In the books of the Saint-Germain Foundation, titled Unveiled Mysteries and The Magic Presence, the Master appeared, disappeared, lived, conversed, and taught important figures of said foundation. Until recently, Many seers claim to have seen him in their psychic visions, but it has been some time since anyone has seen him again. This is because he was offered a new ascension to a higher plane, where he enjoys much more freedom for his functions as avatar of the age. However, recently, Mr. Machoan declared in a communication that the master feels the need for the physical contact he once had. The violet flame, once unknown, is now part of our teaching because the master brought it as a gift to earth. This flame was exclusively applied to egos on the verge of ascending, that is, during spiritual retreats. Part 2. Who was Master Saint-Germain? His reincarnations between the years 303 and 1561. Saint-Anne's the first English martyr. The year of his birth is unknown. He died in 303. Proclus, Neoplatonist born in 410, died in 485. Robertus, the indecisive monk, between the years 1156 and 1211. Roger Bacon, the monk physician, born in 1214, died in 1294. Christian Rosenkreutz, founder of the Rosicrucian Order, born in 1378, died in 1484. Francis Bacon, politician, philosopher and English writer, born in 1561, the last incarnation before manifesting as Prince Rakotsi. It seems that he was not dead. It is said that his grave is empty. Clarification. No incarnation of the master in a female body is known. It seems he was never married in any earthly life. Although Bishop C. W. Leadbeater of the Theosophical Society in his book The Masters and the Path counts among the incarnations of Master Saint Germain Adil Khan, defender of Hungary, this author has allowed herself to exclude him from this account, although she included him in her book The Wonderful Number Seven as the details of his birth and death present no possibility of veracity in the allegation. In other words, Funyade and Khan say that the story of Hungary was born in 1386, eight years after the birth of Christian Rosenkreutz. Khan died in 1459, 25 years before the death of Christian Rosenkreutz. Given this glaring discrepancy, the author refrains from engaging with it until further sources correct it. Preface. Orpheus of Thrace, poet and singer, seems to have been the initiator of the great philosophical system of the West. The name Orpheus comes from a Greek word meaning dark. It is still unknown whether Orpheus was an Oriental with dark skin who instituted the Orphic teaching, or if Orphism was so called because it was a cult practiced for a dark god. It is also unknown whether this darkness referred to rituals practiced behind closed doors or because the god might have been black. What is certain is that the Orphic ideology served as the basis for the noblest theological systems in which Pythagoras and Plato stood out. In Greece, Orphism was open because it consisted of a religion and a cult, 
to the divine story of a multiplicity of gods, which over time came to be called Greek mythology, most simply paid homage to the gods. The true Orphics claimed that each of their deities symbolized either a divine principle, an immutable law, or a faculty of the mind. In other words, it is the pure and advanced understanding of the rays, flames, angelic hierarchy, white hierarchy, and cosmic beings as we know them today in the I Am activity. Symbolism is an irritant to the mind that desperately seeks an explanation. And as Greek intellectuals realized that their mythology was a sort of great riddle hiding very important spiritual truths, they devoted themselves to deciphering the puzzle with soul, life, and heart. The result was the stimulation and awakening of the faculties of abstract thought, previously unknown. This gave birth to a great golden age of intense intellectual spiritual activity, producing in a few centuries nearly 600 philosophers who changed the intellectual life of the entire planet. In Egypt, esoteric teaching with its astrology and astral magic called geometry, reserved exclusively for its hierophants and disciples, was developing in parallel. It gradually spread to other countries thanks to scholars like Pythagoras, who managed to integrate this school through their tenacity. Pythagoras settled on the steps of the building until after seven years he was allowed to enter Palestine, where monotheism reigned. Plato was one of those who adapted esoteric doctrines into his philosophy. St. Albans came into the world, Master Jesus, and spread his metaphysical Christian teaching, thus breaking the hermetic envelope of Hebraism. Although the apostles and evangelists spread Christian teaching by order of its founder after Christ's ascension, it was enormously costly and resulted in much bloodshed before taking root, as is well known. The one who gave it the most important impetus was Paul of Tarsus, a clairvoyant medium, and even today, the ascended Master Hilarion, who, although he never met Master Jesus, heard his voice and had a great manifestation of him on the road to Damascus. The thread of Ariadne that will guide us and follow the trajectory of Master Saint-Germain through his reincarnations on this planet, always with the effort to keep our humanity on the same path without deviating, indicates that the Master, after coming in the vehicle of Saint Joseph to guide and protect the life of Jesus, the founder of Christianity, that is, the next step on the spiritual path, incarnated as an Anglo-Roman child, during the period of martyrdom and torture of Christians, with the aim of spreading his powerful vibrations to the far reaches of the Roman Empire. In the city of Berilamio, located in what is now Herefordshire, England, 20 minutes from London. The island that through the centuries would become the last and greatest empire on planet Earth had to be the cradle of this child who would bear the name Albano Albans, who would become a Benedictine monk and the first martyr of England in 303 AD. It is unknown whether it was his faithful disciples or the Christian church that later marked the place of martyrdom by erecting an abbey they named St. Albans. Over the centuries in 757, England was divided into small kingdoms, and in one of them this monastery became one of the most important houses of the order. Finally, in 1077, a Gothic cathedral was built with the authentic bricks of the ancient city of Verulamium. On June 17th, England celebrates the Feast of St. Albans. Today, in higher philosophical circles, it is said that the germ of every idea, including Christian ideas, is found in Plato. As Christian ideology took shape, paganism declined, which the Church called paganism, that is, Orphism and esotericism, of which Plato was the main representative. A century after St. Albans, Proclus was born in Byzantium in 410 AD. History says that between Plotinus' death 27 years earlier and Proclus's birth, the growth of the Christian religion and the decline of the classical pagan world took place, adding that Proclus came to restore the esoteric tradition. Neoplatonism comes from the Greek neos, new, meaning it renews Platonism. Proclus studied in Alexandria and Athens, he was a disciple of Plotinus, who represents the reform of the idea of the One. Platonism has been renewed several times in history, in the Renaissance in the 15th century, at the Cambridge School in the 17th century, and it continues to this day as a fundamental philosophical current in modern spiritual ideas. This Platonism 
is the mystical desire to expand consciousness, to make direct and personal contact with divine beings. You will be amazed at the similarity between Proclus's Neoplatonism and modern metaphysics. You will clearly see that the master placed Neoplatonism in strategic places to correct the path whenever it deviated or to indicate new routes to those who walked them. Seeking Neoplatonism means seeking the unity that is reality, while diversity is an illusion. Seek the unity behind the apparent diversity. Neoplatonism studies universal principles, thus accepting all gods integrated into the one God, all men as one humanity. The great Neoplatonic truth is that everything is one, and with this conviction in the heart and the noblest thoughts, one makes a positive contribution to universal brotherhood. Neoplatonism teaches understanding but not acceptance of the inferior, because understanding brings unlimited appreciation. Neoplatonism advises moderation in everything one possesses to fully enjoy what one has, for having too much diminishes joy. Neoplatonism teaches that belonging to a sect brings dogmas, and dogmas are limitations in ideas. Sectarianism is a limiting force, Neoplatonism says that one must seek the good in everything. This does not mean that all good is pleasant. For example, it is good to be unhappy when one disobeys a universal law. It is good to receive harm if we have done harm to others. It is good to feel sick if one has disobeyed the laws of health, meaning that things as they are, are good. Neoplatonism ordains that, once the primary point of view is understood and accepted, the student becomes an instructor to others. This is why Neoplatonism is particularly practical in our time. Greek intellectuals said that Proclus was protected by the gods, that Minerva received him at his birth and protected him all his life. Naturally, like every sect, every teaching and every religion contains a part of the truth. As soon as consciences are divided, an avatar, a master or a prophet comes. There was always a volunteer, as we mentioned earlier, to correct what had deviated, Proclus recounted that, very young, Minerva appeared to him and advised him to study philosophy. Moreover, when he contracted a disease that no doctor could diagnose, and his whole family gathered waiting for his death, a radiant young man whose head emitted luminous rays approached the bed, placed a finger on his forehead, and pronounced his name, Proclus. The child was instantly healed and the young man disappeared under this divine direction, Proclus studied according to his own inclination of mind. His intellectual capacity was among the highest, and he himself knew he was destined to be Plato's successor. He went to Egypt, studied with a famous rhetorician, then joined the school of Hierophants where he was instructed in the mysteries of esoteric religion. In Alexandria, he studied with Greek philosophers, mathematics with Hero, a man of deep spirituality and versed in the mysteries of numbers. Then he wanted to study Aristotelian doctrine with Master Olympiodorus, who was so impressed by Proclus's abilities that he offered him his daughter in marriage so he would not leave Alexandria. The young woman was, of course, a great philosopher, but Proclus, guided by his divine mentor, continued to prepare his mind in Platonic discipline. Pythagoras settled on the steps of the building until after seven years he was allowed to enter Palestine, where monotheism reigned. Plato was one of those who adapted esoteric doctrines into his philosophy. St. Albans came into the world, Master Jesus, and spread his metaphysical Christian teaching, thus breaking the hermetic envelope of Hebraism. Although the apostles and evangelists spread Christian teaching by order of its founder after Christ's ascension, it was enormously costly, and resulted in much bloodshed before taking root, as is well known. The one who gave it the most important impetus was Paul of Tarsus, a clairvoyant medium, and even today the ascended Master Hilarion, who, although he never met Master Jesus, heard his voice and had a great manifestation of him on the road to Damascus, the thread of Ariadne that will guide us and follow the trajectory of Master Saint-Germain through his reincarnations on this planet, always with the effort to keep our humanity on the same path without deviating, indicates that the Master, after coming in the vehicle of St. Joseph, to guide and protect the life of Jesus, the founder of Christianity, that is, the next step on the spiritual path, incarnated as an Anglo-Roman child, 
during the period of martyrdom and torture of Christians, with the aim of spreading his powerful vibrations to the far reaches of the Roman Empire, in the city of Berilamio, located in what is now Herefordshire, England, 20 minutes from London. And you know the island that through the centuries would become the last and greatest empire on planet Earth had to be the cradle of this child who would bear the name Albano Albans, who would become a Benedictine monk and the first martyr of England in 303 AD. It is unknown whether it was his faithful disciples or the Christian church that later marked the place of martyrdom by erecting an abbey they named St. Albans. Over the centuries in 757, England was divided into small kingdoms, and in one of them, this monastery became one of the most important houses of the order. Finally, in 1077, a Gothic cathedral was built with the authentic bricks of the ancient city of Verulamium. On June 17, England celebrates the Feast of St. Albans. Today, in higher philosophical circles, it is said that the germ of every idea, including Christian ideas, is found in Plato. As Christian ideology took shape, paganism declined, which the Church called paganism, that is, Orphism and Esotericism, of which Plato was the main representative. A century after St. Albans, Proclus was born in Byzantium in 410 AD. History says that between Plotinus's death 27 years earlier and Proclus's birth, the growth of the Christian religion and the decline of the classical pagan world took place, adding that Proclus came to restore the esoteric tradition. Neoplatonism comes from the Greek neos, new, meaning it renews Platonism. Proclus studied in Alexandria and Athens. He was a disciple of Plotinus, who represents the reform of the idea of the one. Platonism has been renewed several times in history, in the Renaissance in the 15th century, at the Cambridge School in the 17th century, and it continues to this day as a fundamental philosophical current in modern spiritual ideas. This Platonism is the mystical desire to expand consciousness to make direct and personal contact with divine beings. You will be amazed at the similarity between Proclus's Neoplatonism and modern metaphysics. You will clearly see that the master placed Neoplatonism in strategic places to correct the path whenever it deviated or to indicate new routes to those who walked them. Seeking Neoplatonism means seeking the unity that is reality, while diversity is an illusion. Seek the unity behind the apparent diversity. Neoplatonism studies universal principles, thus accepting all gods integrated into the one God, all men as one humanity. The great Neoplatonic truth is that everything is one, and with this conviction in the heart and the noblest thoughts, one makes a positive contribution to universal brotherhood. Neoplatonism teaches understanding but not acceptance of the inferior, because understanding brings unlimited appreciation. Neoplatonism advises moderation in everything one possesses to fully enjoy what one has, for having too much diminishes joy. Neoplatonism teaches that belonging to a sect brings dogmas, and dogmas are limitations in ideas. Sectarianism is a limiting force. Neoplatonism says that one must seek the good in everything. This does not mean that all good is pleasant. For example, it is good to be unhappy when one disobeys a universal law. It is good to receive harm if we have done harm to others. It is good to feel sick if one has disobeyed the laws of health, meaning that things as they are, are good. Neoplatonism ordains that, once the primary point of view is understood and accepted, the student becomes an instructor to others. This is why Neoplatonism is particularly practical in our time. Greek intellectuals said that Proclus was protected by the gods, that Minerva received him at his birth and protected him all his life. Naturally, like every sect, every teaching and every religion contains a part of the truth. As soon as consciences are divided, an avatar a master or a prophet comes. There was always a volunteer, as we mentioned earlier, to correct what had deviated. Proclus recounted that very young, Minerva appeared to him and advised him to study philosophy. Moreover, when he contracted a disease that no doctor could diagnose and his whole family gathered waiting for his death, a radiant young man, whose head emitted luminous rays, approached the bed, placed a finger on his forehead and pronounced his name. Proclus. 
The child was instantly healed and the young man disappeared under this divine direction. Proclus studied according to his own inclination of mind. His intellectual capacity was among the highest, and he himself knew he was destined to be Plato's successor. He went to Egypt, studied with a famous rhetorician, then joined the school of Hierophants where he was instructed in the mysteries of esoteric religion. In Alexandria, he studied with Greek philosophers, mathematics with Hero, a man of deep spirituality and versed in the mysteries of numbers. Then he wanted to study Aristotelian doctrine with Master Olympiodorus, who was so impressed by Proclus's abilities that he offered him his daughter in marriage so he would not leave Alexandria. The young woman was, of course, a great philosopher, but Proclus, guided by his divine mentor, continued to prepare his mind in Platonic discipline. At the age of twenty, Proclus went to Athens, the guardian of philosophy, and was introduced to Syrianus, the most eminent sage of the time, an expert in the doctrines of Orpheus, Pythagoras and Plato. He then studied with Completiarius, who, despite being very old and no longer accepting disciples, took Proclus as a student and became so fond of him that he invited him to live with him until his death two years later. Completiarius left instructions designating Syrianus as Proclus's successor in education, having already absorbed the lesser mysteries. Syrianus guided him in the sacred discipline of Plato, and thus Proclus fully achieved his stature as Plato's successor through an orderly progression and the merits of his own mind. At 28, he was a recognized leader among the Platonists and had written numerous works, including a sage commentary on Plato's Timaeus. He did not eat animal meat, but advised others to eat it occasionally for physical strength, fasted once a month, and celebrated the full moon with abstinence instead of festivities as was customary. He advocated common sense regarding everything related to the physical body. For philosophy students, he recommended a light diet because heavy foods and loaded digestion interfered with the mental clarity necessary to establish a mystical contact with divinities. Proclus succeeded Syrianus as director of the Neoplatonic school in Athens in 450 BC, and from then on, he devoted himself entirely to Platonic mysticism. The Christians, rapidly undermining the Greek mysteries and the hatred they harbored for him, forced him to seek refuge in Asia Minor. A disciple of Proclus described this hatred as an attack by vultures, which was unjust because it forced him to study the mysteries of Eastern philosophy after a philosophically enriching year. Minerva sent him back to Athens, where he remained for the rest of his life. Proclus was tolerant of all religions, participated in all rituals and celebrations of different gods, believing that the various beliefs honored the same gods under different names. He reached the age of 75, had a large circle of friends united in the Pythagorean Brotherhood, died in Athens, and was buried near his master Syrianus. His active life ended at 70 years old. His death was announced by a series of celestial disturbances, including a solar eclipse, the epitaph on his tomb was written by himself, wishing for simple funerals without the usual mourners. He died in 485 BC. The Platonic school of mysticism ceased as a separate movement, and the stream of his thought mingled with the growing stream of Christian metaphysics. I, Proclus, having paid my debt to nature in the dust, will be a delight. The great Syrianus shaped my youth and left me as his successor in truth, our bodies share a common tomb, and our two souls a common place in the ethereal planes. Robert the monk experiences something extraordinary, and it is that we do not know which of the Roberts to choose to decide who was Master Saint-Germain. Let's tell what we know about the two, and you will decide which one seems most appropriate to you. The first of the two, Robert of Torigny, a monk, was born in 1110. He was first prior of Beck, then abbot of Mont-Saint-Michel. He wrote historical chronicles covering a period from the year 385 to the year of his death in 1186. History records that his writings were of great value for Anglo-Norman history, while also dealing with continental subjects. It is relevant that this ego could remember events from his two previous lives, one occurring in 303, corresponding to the history he recorded in 385, and the second in the following century, very close to the previous one. Moreover, the fact that it was valuable for Anglo-Norman history is vain. He received it in the southwest of the island, which was a Roman possession invaded by the Normans. 
The second Robert of Auxerre, a monk, was born in 1156 and died in 1211. The abbot of the monastery of saint marien where he entered, required him to write a universal history covering the period between the creation of the world and the year 1211, the year it happened. Robert of Auxerre became an authority on history between 1181 and 1211, the year of his death. After his death, other writers continued his work, but Robert of Auxerre's history was constantly used by all other historians. The original manuscript is still kept in Auxerre. The thread of Ariadne tells us that it is typical of Master Saint-Germain to start something and become an authority in the matter. If it was our beloved master, there had to be something very great in this fragment that made an entity incarnate and live only 55 years, just the time necessary to achieve it. Roger Bacon, the monk physician known as Dr. Mirabilis, was born in Somerset, England in 1294. The spirit of the master was destined to be reborn to act in religious orders, the thread of Ariadne tells us. At the age of 70, during the Inquisition, he was in England, where the Inquisition had not entered, intending to vigorously defend the esoteric development he had restored in religious tradition. The Inquisition wanted at all costs to annihilate and make him disappear, discrediting and burning alive anyone who manifested possessing no more and no less than the gifts of the Holy Spirit, labelling as witchcraft anything that was not dogma and fanaticism. Naturally, he was a remarkable young man for his great precocity. He chose his cradle within a family of wealthy farmers who could allow him to indulge in anything he wanted to study, and he was born with a great thirst for knowledge. The farmer, believing he had a son for agriculture, realized it was impossible to force his son to do anything other than read books. He took him to the village priest, who gladly accepted him, but a conflict quickly formed between the father, the son, and the priest. Raja s'enfuit alors de chez lui et se réfugia dans un monastère franciscain où il put se consacrer à ses études. Avec le temps, les frères franciscains l'envoyèrent à Oxford pour parfaire son éducation, puis à Paris. Parmi tant d'autres choses, il est dit que Roger s'intéressait aux sciences occultes et acquit rapidement de grandes connaissances en magie blanche, comme on l'appelle aujourd'hui. Pour cela, il incarnait l'esprit de Saint-Germain. Roger Bacon est devenu célèbre pour toujours en tant que créateur de l'occultisme aux côtés d'Albert le Grand, un obiste ratiste, alchimiste, scientiste et mage, et du tuteur de ce dernier, Thomas d'Aquin, un savant logisticien, un métaphysicien sévère et un mage. Il pratiquait non seulement l'alchimie, mais aussi ce qu'on appelait alors « les sciences expérimentales », qui n'était rien d'autre que ce qu'on appelle aujourd'hui « la sorcellerie », ce qui consistait en la collaboration d'élémentaux du plan. Ils étaient experts en cela. Moïse et les hiérophantes égyptiens. Moreover, Roger Bacon distinguished himself in chemistry, mathematics, astronomy, metaphysics, biology, with a specialization in species multiplication, engineering, construction, and mechanical sciences, for which he foresaw the future possibility of ships without oars, carriages without horses and flying machines, all of which later became reality. In medicine, he earned the title of Dr. Mirabilis for his work, Mirabilis Protestatis Artis et Natura. He discovered convex lenses for telescopes and for correcting presbyopia. His name will always be associated with gunpowder, which he contributed to discover. His experiments in chemistry naturally led him to study the philosopher's stone, and from there to the purification of gold and the elixir of life. It was a small step to the effects of purifying the body, with the help of certain appropriate herbs and knowledge of the stars. He composed the liquid that later, while acting in the courts of Louis, he mentioned as the reason for his longevity. Roger Bacon was a defender of freedom of thought, and in such an ignorant age, all these things were deeply suspicious, to the point of leading to persecution by the brothers of his own order, who eventually kicked him out for being rebellious and revolutionary. But it is precisely for this reason that this ego had incarnated and he took refuge in Paris, where he had studied. However, there he found himself under a regime of repression and appealed to Pope Clement IV, who expressed a desire to possess a copy of his work. The fiery Franciscan managed to insult everyone, including Albert the Great and Thomas Aquinas, 
whom he catalogued as ignorant and illiterate in philosophy and metaphysics, as well as his fellow Franciscans and Dominicans. Not in vain our patron and avatar of the new era, after so many connections with the orders and countries of Latin language, he no longer wrote in any language other than Latin, and despite significant economic problems, he managed to complete his major and minor works. These works found favour with Clement IV, and he was allowed to return to Oxford to continue his scientific studies. There, he wrote a compendium of philosophy in which he demonstrated the error between the relations of philosophy and theology. This displeased the ecclesiastical authorities so much that they imprisoned him and burned all his books. For his time, Roger Bacon's intellectual level was very high. He was the first to argue that observation and experimentation were indispensable for acquiring scientific knowledge in natural sciences, or in other words, that phenomena such as psychic phenomena, magic, witchcraft, spiritualism, etc., cannot be studied without experimenting with them. One day the king visited a nobleman in Oxford, and knowing of the monk Bacon's fame, the king expressed his desire to meet him. The lord of the castle sent a messenger to fetch him from Oxford. Roger agreed and told the messenger, Go ahead and announce me, although I predict that I will arrive before you at the king's presence. The messenger laughed and bet him that he would arrive soon, as it was only a few five miles to travel. However, the monk departed immediately. Shortly after, Roger arrived at the king's court, who welcomed him and asked him to demonstrate his skills to him and his court. Roger courteously accepted and replied to the king, I shall satisfy several of your senses, majesty. Saying this, he took out a wand named Of Virtue. He made a few movements in the air, and suddenly beautiful music emanated from the ether. Then he summoned a group of dancers who performed a magnificent ballet to the music. Bacon made gestures again and a delightful fragrance spread throughout the space. The ballet troupe disappeared and a table filled with the most delicious dishes appeared. All the guests began to eat, and Bacon turned to the king to ask if he wished to see more of his magic. The king was satisfied and encouraged him to ask for a favour. In turn, Roger replied that he desired nothing else but the favour of his king. The king assured him of the love of his court and his own, and gifted him with a precious jewel in thanks. Then Roger added, What I do not see here is the messenger that your majesty sent to fetch me. All the courtiers turned to look for him everywhere, and suddenly one of them exclaimed that he saw him coming. The messenger did indeed present himself, but in such a dishevelled and upset state that when he saw him, he uttered a curse in anger. To appease him, Roger said to him, I have a special demonstration for you, my friend. Look. He lifted one of the two curtains of the hall, thus revealing one of the kitchen helpers holding a ladle, startled at being caught. Bacon added, As I am not about to find out how you manage financially, I will be kind enough to pay for your trip back home, my dear. And the young woman disappeared. This is an example of the spectacles that pleased at that time, and were practiced by troubadours and actors of the Middle Ages. They were performed with the collaboration of elementals from the astral or psychic plane, but they carried great danger. Once one opened the door to elementals, it was very difficult to expel them and send them back to their plane. For this reason, castle enchantments lasted so long, as well as apparitions in very old places where there was talk of a haunted house, tales of apparitions, ghosts, or people who sold their souls or other favours. This happened because there had been spectacles and events in these places where these elementals, to whom the astral door had been opened, did not want to leave the physical plane any more. It was just an elemental presenting itself in a terrifying form and aspect, and offering all kinds of wonders to seduce the credulous so that the doors of the physical plane were opened wide to them. Moreover, Roger Bacon distinguished himself in chemistry, mathematics, astronomy, metaphysics, biology with a specialization in species multiplication, engineering, construction, and mechanical sciences, for which he foresaw the future possibility of ships without oars, carriages without horses, and flying machines, all of which later became reality. In medicine, he earned the title of Dr. Mirabilis for his work, Mirabilis Protestates Artis et Natura. He discovered convex lenses for telescopes and for correcting presbyopia. His name will always be associated with gunpowder, which he contributed to discover. 
His experiments in chemistry naturally led him to study the philosopher's stone and from there to the purification of gold and the elixir of life. It was a small step to the effects of purifying the body with the help of certain appropriate herbs and knowledge of the stars. He composed the liquid that later, while acting in the courts of Louis, he mentioned as the reason for his longevity. Roger Bacon was a defender of freedom of thought, and in such an ignorant age, all these things were deeply suspicious, to the point of leading to persecution by the brothers of his own order, who eventually kicked him out for being rebellious and revolutionary. But it is precisely for this reason that this ego had incarnated, and he took refuge in Paris, where he had studied. However, there he found himself under a regime of repression and appealed to Pope Clement IV, who expressed a desire to possess a copy of his work. The fiery Franciscan managed to insult everyone, including Albert the Great and Thomas Aquinas, whom he catalogued as ignorant and illiterate in philosophy and metaphysics, as well as his fellow Franciscans and Dominicans. Not in vain our patron and avatar of the new era, after so many connections with the orders and countries of Latin language, he no longer wrote in any language other than Latin, and despite significant economic problems, he managed to complete his major and minor works. These works found favour with Clement IV, and he was allowed to return to Oxford to continue his scientific studies. There he wrote a compendium of philosophy in which he demonstrated the error between the relations of philosophy and theology. This displeased the ecclesiastical authorities so much that they imprisoned him and burned all his books. For his time, Roger Bacon's intellectual level was very high. He was the first to argue that observation and experimentation were indispensable for acquiring scientific knowledge in natural sciences, or in other words, that phenomena such as psychic phenomena, magic, witchcraft, spiritualism, etc., cannot be studied without experimenting with them. One day the king visited a nobleman in Oxford, and knowing of the monk Bacon's fame, the king expressed his desire to meet him. The lord of the castle sent a messenger to fetch him from Oxford. Roger agreed and told the messenger, Go ahead and announce me, although I predict that I will arrive before you at the king's presence. The messenger laughed and bet him that he would arrive soon, as it was only a few five miles to travel. However, the monk departed immediately. Shortly after, Roger arrived at the king's court, who welcomed him and asked him to demonstrate his skills to him and his court. Roger courteously accepted and replied to the king, I shall satisfy several of your senses, Majesty. Saying this, he took out a wand named of virtue. He made a few movements in the air, and suddenly beautiful music emanated from the ether. Then he summoned a group of dancers who performed a magnificent ballet to the music. Bacon made gestures again, and a delightful fragrance spread throughout the space. The ballet troupe disappeared, and a table filled with the most delicious dishes appeared. All the guests began to eat, and Bacon turned to the king to ask if he wished to see more of his magic. The king was satisfied and encouraged him to ask for a favour. In turn, Roger replied that he desired nothing else but the favour of his king. The king assured him of the love of his court and his own, and gifted him with a precious jewel in thanks. Then Roger added, what I do not see here is the messenger that your majesty sent to fetch me. All the courtiers turned to look for him everywhere, and suddenly one of them exclaimed that he saw him coming. The messenger did indeed present himself, but in such a dishevelled and upset state that when he saw him he uttered a curse in anger. To appease him, Roger said to him, I have a special demonstration for you, my friend. Look. He lifted one of the two curtains of the hall, thus revealing one of the kitchen helpers holding a ladle, startled at being caught. Bacon added, As I am not about to find out how you manage financially, I will be kind enough to pay for your trip back home, my dear. And the young woman disappeared. This is an example of the spectacles that pleased at that time and were practiced by troubadours and actors of the Middle Ages. They were performed with the collaboration of elementals from the astral or psychic plane, but they carried great danger. Once one opened the door to elementals, it was very difficult to expel them and send them back to their plane. For this reason, castle enchantments lasted so long, as well as apparitions in very old places where there was talk of a haunted house, tales of apparitions, ghosts, or people who sold their souls or other favours. This happened because there had been spectacles and events in these places, 
where these elementals, to whom the astral door had been opened, did not want to leave the physical plane anymore. It was just an elemental presenting itself in a terrifying form and aspect, and offering all kinds of wonders to seduce the credulous so that the doors of the physical plane were opened wide to them. This is the story of a typical case where Frank Roger Bacon acted. A man was burdened with debts and an elemental dressed in attire offered him large sums of money to save him, on the condition that he promised to give him his soul after paying off all his debts. As one can imagine, the man paid and paid, but he had no hurry to settle all his debts. Finally, the moment came when he could no longer delay his creditors, and his despair was such that he was going to commit suicide. When Brother Bacon stopped his hand and asked him the reason for this, the man recounted the facts to him. The monk replied to him, Go to the meeting place with him, but deny everything he claims from you. If he continues to demand something from you, insist on naming a judge, and above all, insist that the first man who passes by judge him. The man acted as he was told, and when the other insisted, saying, Your soul belongs to me now, and I insist that you give it to me, the man replied, I insist on a judge intervening. Let's fetch the first man passing by here. Very well, he replied, and they waited a few minutes. Brother Bacon passed by as the man awaited him, and stopping him he explained the situation to him. He also addressed Brother Bacon, saying, The condition was that, once all his debts were paid, he would give me his soul. The time has passed and he has settled everything, he said. The man confirmed this to be true. Well, said the monk, if you have indeed paid all your debts, ask him yourself. No, sir, I have not received anything from him so far, replied the monk. Do not give him a penny, and you will be free, he declared. The agreement was that you respect this man as long as you owe him money. So how can you torment him if he has given you everything he owed you? I command you to disappear by the holy cross. He disappeared in a flash, and the monk turned to the man and recommended never to give him a cent. Gradually people regretted involving elementals in the affairs of the physical plani, and the rumor spread that it brought bad luck. Calling spirits in spiritualism was considered a brave and learned enterprise, like that of our dear master, who undertook to teach the truth through the ages. Monk Roger Bacon was imprisoned for fourteen years and was finally released, but he died two years later, in 1294. Christian Rosenkreutz was born in 1378 and died in 1484. German, noble orphan, he was educated in a monastery where he learned Latin and Greek. Christian religion was very poorly understood and taught at the time. At the age of 17 he left the monastery with a brother, and they travelled to Damascus, Jerusalem, Arabia, Egypt, Morocco, and then Spain. With much effort Christian lost his brother in Cyprus, but he decided to continue his journey alone. Arriving in Damascus, he learned of a secret circle of theosophists living in the city of Dankar. He headed there and was graciously received. It was announced to him that he had been awaited for a long time for verification. The brothers made him relive several scenes of his life. They were experts in magical arts, and the young man decided to stay with them. They immediately initiated him into occult sciences. He learned the Arabic language and translated the book M into Latin. After three years of mystical instruction, according to the brothers' instructions, he left the mysterious city and first went to Egypt, then to Fez. <laughs> there he connected with other masters who taught him the best way to invoke elemental spirits. After the end of his initiation in Fez, two years later, he traveled to Spain, where he tried to convince scholars of their error, but they mocked him claiming they had learned black arts with a master far superior to him, namely Satan himself, at the University of Salamanca. Full of indignant nobility, Christian left Spain and travelled to other countries where, unfortunately, he encountered the same fate. Finally, he found refuge in his homeland and remained there, secluded in solitude, writing. After five years of hermitic life, he resolved that one who had succeeded in transmuting metals and making the elixir of life was undoubtedly destined for a nobler purpose than remaining isolated. At least, this was the opinion of those around him. We do not know the arrangements of the cosmic hierarchy that guided him. Gradually, he gathered members around him, who would form the Order of the Rose Cross. When their number reached four, they invented a magical language and a dictionary full of hidden wisdom, titled 
everything man can desire, ask for, and expect. He translated the wisdom of Solomon, Moses, and Enoch into Latin, and founded the first of the Rose Cross Societies, called the House of the Holy Spirit. When they were eight brothers, he decided to separate them to travel the world founding chapters of the Order in eight different countries. They agreed that the Order would remain secret for one hundred years. In his time, Christian Rosenkreutz died and was buried in one of the Order's secret houses. The original members had disappeared, and it was only in the third generation of successors, during repairs, that the tomb appeared in a hidden crypt. It was inscribed with magical characters, and according to the history of the order illuminated by the son of the mages, the body was in a perfectly preserved state, as is the case for every enlightened one, whose pure cells are filled with light and therefore cannot corrupt. In the sarcophagus were documents of great value to the order, clarifying the confusions that troubled the various chapters. These chapters claim that Christian Rosenkreutz was surely an imposter or a symbol, as each considered itself the original house. One of the documents foresaw the spreading of the Order's designs through a circular inviting any prepared and sincere person to initiation. In 1614, philosophers and the people of Castle in Germany were surprised by the publication of a circular pamphlet titled Fama Fraternitatis, or Brotherly Opinion of the Meritorious Order of the Rose Cross, addressed to scholars in general and European leaders. It was a message from a few anonymous adepts, deeply disturbed by the condition of humanity, desiring its regeneration and perfection. It exhorted all sincere men to unite, to establish a scientific synthesis, to find the perfect system for the development of occult arts. It pleaded for an end to all discord and conflicts among intellectuals of the time, as well as the dissolution of authorities with their outdated theories. It emphasized that just as religion had been reformed and purified, science must also be treated in the same way. It proposed that all of this be directed by a fraternity of the enlightened, children of light, initiated into the mysteries of the East by a high member of the hierarchy of adepts, capable of leading the era to its perfection. This circular had seven editions in three years. They worked with alchemists in the same spirit that repudiated orthodox religion, fleeing dogmas and slavery, aiming to establish the freedom of God's children in a new form. The brothers of the Order of the Rose Cross admitted that the Founder's spirit had lived many physical existences, taking a new body each time his vehicles became useless, or to change the scope of his activities, which aligned with the communication of Master Saint-Germain regarding his more than 40 borrowed bodies. Francis Bacon, born in 1561, was declared in history as the son of Sir Nicholas Bacon and Lady Anne Cook. However, court whispers announced that he was actually the son of Queen Elizabeth I of England and her favourite, Robert Dudley, Earl of Leicester. Indeed, the previous year, in 1560, the Queen and Dudley had made several attempts at a secret marriage. All attempts failed because the Queen had failed to show up at clandestine meetings. At the last one, after solemnly promising she would come, she tired of waiting and as night fell, she dismissed the judge and was preparing to leave when the Queen arrived. She had hurried only to tell Dudley to excuse her, citing insurmountable obstacles at court that had prevented her from keeping her word and had ruined everything. The Queen entered a carriage, shielded by curtains, and they disappeared together into the night. The next day, as if nothing had happened, the Queen attended to the affairs of her kingdom in her cabinet. But a few months later, the strategic fashion of the pointed and rigid waist, like a board dropped from the chest between voluminous pleats on each side and on the hips, boldly designed to conceal an embarrassing pregnancy, emerged. The Queen finally gave up any idea of marriage, esteeming her right to reign as she pleased and without interference, continuing to be called the Virgin Queen. To perpetuate this charade, assuming Francis was hers, he had to be entrusted to a courtier for adoption. Later we will see how everything confirmed the truth, which is always visible to those who have eyes to see. Francis Bacon was thus born in 1561. Almost from his early days, he proved to be an exceptionally intelligent boy. He entered Trinity College at the age of 12 and Cambridge three years later. Not yet 16, 
he developed an aversion to Aristotle's philosophy, finding it sterile and devoid of anything that could truly benefit human life. After his university studies, Lord Bacon sent him to Paris under the tutelage of the English ambassador to study politics and diplomacy. There he became interested in experimental science, proposing a radically new concept about the goal of human knowledge, expressing that in antiquity the sole purpose was to discover new verbal arguments, while modern science sought to conquer and dominate nature by wrenching its secrets from it, not through eternal palaver, but through experimentation, the union of theory and practice, knowledge and technique. He had the same goal that motivated him throughout all his lives. He already began to write his major work, Instauratio Magna de Dignitate Scientiarum, intended to restore man's authority over matter. The thread of Ariadne always indicates to us the temperament of the adept in his custom of producing all his writings in Latin and in his effort to bring humanity to dominate and free itself from all constraints and repressions. Sir Nicholas's death forced him to return to London, where he discovered that his father's will granted him the smallest share of the inheritance, thus forcing him to earn his living. He dedicated himself to legal study. Francis Bacon spent 25 years of his life in the shadow of Lord Burley, his maternal uncle, who systematically and constantly hindered and humiliated him, so markedly that it seemed he had been entrusted not only to be watched, but also to be dominated and repressed. All of Francis's attempts to attain his appropriate position at court were fruitless. It seemed that Queen Elizabeth had no other concern than to revive an unfortunate past. Eventually, perhaps compelled by court gossip and unfavourable assumptions about the Queen and her agent Burley, he secured a seat in Parliament. But any idea that they could manipulate him like a docile instrument was dispelled. The first thing the young man did was position himself in opposition to a royal request. Naturally, this drew disapproval from the Queen and Uncle Burley, and there were no more favours. However, it was almost impossible to repress him. Francis's many talents, his scientific and literary works, even during times of great adversity, further enhanced his reputation. In 1605, he published his Advancement of Divine and Human Knowledge, which constituted the first part of his Instauratio Magna. This was intended to bring a new system of learning and pedagogy to the world. With Francis Bacon, modern philosophy began anew. Against Aristotle's Organon, he set his Novum Organum, just as Proclus had restored Neoplatonism. Francis Bacon revived Platonism and Neoplatonism for the fourth time in the history of human intellect, freeing the minds of his time from the discordances of Aristotelian theology. Lord Bacon was a Rosicrucian and became Emperor of the Order. The Vox Populi continued to murmur about Francis Bacon, asserting that the clever comedies written by one William Shakespeare were none other than those of Francis Bacon. The man who signed the works, namely William Shakespeare, was the son of a farmer from Stratford-upon-Avon. He was not exactly a peasant, as he held certain municipal positions in that town, but neither was he a person who could have provided his son with the sufficient culture to express himself in the poetic and scholarly terms of Shakespearean theatre. The William Shakespeare who signed the works earned his living working as a doorkeeper in a theatre and occasionally, in emergencies, played a minor role. It is not difficult to deduce that Francis Bacon used this friendship to bring his works to the theatre through this channel. There are about 30 plays that draw attention to a human or social situation for which the adept, and thus Francis Bacon, had always worked. These 30-some works manifest a continuous flow of the law of life that we know well today. Furthermore, it has been revealed by elder brothers in metaphysics that Shakespeare's plays contain no fewer than 500 acrostics of Francis Bacon's name. Also, in a coded cipher appears in one of the works, revealing the inner instruction of an initiatory school of which Francis Bacon was a member. It has been said in passing that this man is the author of an encrypted code that remains today the world's authority. Upon the death of Queen Elizabeth I of England, King James the Fye ascended the throne, automatically eliminating resistance against Francis Bacon. He was appointed Solicitor General, then Attorney General, later Lord Keeper of the Great Seal, and finally Lord Chancellor, all in less than 11 years. 
Despite this, simultaneously, he was elevated to the title of Lord, and three years later, Viscount St. Albans, or Ariadne. Envious individuals were very active, attacking him, slandering him, and succeeding in having him imprisoned in the Tower of London. Bacon was a defender of the king's policies, and friends who had served Elizabeth would have preferred him to remain in the same humble position she had kept him in. The king released and exonerated him, but Bacon retired to private life, where he continued writing his Instauratio Magna and social plays that needed correcting. The thread of Ariadne leads us to the Church of St. Michael in Verulam, within St. Adanzi's Cathedral, where it is said that Francis Bacon's body was buried. However, rumour has it that there was never a body in that grave, nor did one ever exist. In a much deeper plan of knowledge, we will discuss the incarnation of the adept in Francis Bacon's body. Every child brings into their electrons a number or vibrational frequency, their equation. This vibrational frequency repeats in the sounds that compose their first and last names. Regardless of any coincidence in the name that the mother wishes to give the child, it is the vibration that is recorded in the mother's mind and forces her to choose the name that suits that child in that incarnation. If for some reason the name is changed by the father or family members, the child suffers and will suffer throughout their life from multiple obstacles, frustrations and imbalances between their path and their character or temperament. Sometimes this constitutes a serious delay for the individual. Often the person changes their name and manages to restore their incarnation on the path that corresponds to them to fulfill their destiny. Electronic forces know nothing about what is called on earth moral conditions or morality. Only the law of attraction acts to bring things back to their point of harmony. If the lower ego of Francis returned to the task of becoming the most remarkable wife in the most powerful empire on earth, a cataclysm occurred in him by imposing a vibratory descent with the name Bacon, which he had worn in three previous reincarnations, not repeating a step already taken without bringing the undesirable conditions of the past from which the ego has already graduated spiritually and intellectually. Francis accomplished what he had come to do physically. He suffered constant troubles to the point of having to return to Verulamium and the name of Sant that had been given to him centuries ago. He could have been King of England, the first metaphysical king, and could have changed the course of the whole earth afterwards, which may have been the intention of the adept, who then had to return almost without respite. These disruptions occur more often than one might think possible. Often the saying, man proposes, God disposes, turns into, God proposes, man disposes, making a mess by intervening clumsily in his terrible gravity. With infinite patience, masters and avatars straighten and adjust the twisted charges. Beyond the law, if it were possible, who is Master Saint-Germain? As we have already said, the Master has recently ascended again after offering Earth the immense resource of the transmuting violet flame, a supreme gift that frees from karma, the punishments that humans inflict upon themselves for any improperly qualified energy and human creation. According to the law of the circle, the master receives his just retribution, which in this case was the title of God Freedom. Master Saint-Germain stated in a previous communication, My name disintegrated with my past, and today I am the son of freedom, and it is my great privilege to propagate the cause of freedom on the earthly plane. The God Freedom is not native to Earth, but from the planet Uranus. Uranians are androgynous, and do not divide into twin flames or complements to evolve in parallel. The relationship of the goddess Portia with the god Freedom is that of powerful assistance in the great cosmic ceremonies. The illuminated esoteric writer David Anguius, in his book Adepts of the Five Elements, provides an explanation of what is often called the moral chaos of our time, namely the predominant situation among youth, drug use and homosexuality. Briefly, Uranian influence pushes each human being to intensely seek their opposite pole within themselves, momentarily, while humanity rids itself of the accumulation of destructive energy around it, preventing it from seeing the truth. As long as it seeks its opposite outside itself, it interprets this Uranian influence it feels, but does not understand in terms of a polarity located in another being, 
preferably one of its own sex, instead of finding it within itself. As the era progresses and humanity rids itself of this negative energy, it will begin to clearly see the truth of being. Regarding the issue of drugs, like the planet Uranus, this represents great progress. Earth already feels its luminous atmosphere as it rapidly orbits. Its vibrations stimulate imagination and, above all, the desire to travel beyond dreams and wonders. Drugs create the illusion of this journey. The youth, always rushed and thoughtful, believes it is the shortcut to truth and rushes into it, unaware that drugs create an urgent need in the system, increasingly so, leading to ruin and darkness nullifying the strength of will to initiate Earth into its new orbit around Uranus and proximity to Venus. It was necessary to consume and dissolve the effluvium of misused energy that covers Earth like a mantle. Planetary leaders have ordered the use of the liberating violet flame by the person of the Seventh Ray Director, the Ascended Master Saint-Germain. The salvation of youth and a large majority of human beings depends on whether this effluvium we have spoken of is consumed and dissolved, forgetting what we really are, first of all, and then the continued ignorance of our spiritual truth, is due to this veil that prevents us from seeing the glories that rightfully belong to us. We should live in eternal youth and beauty, in eternal happiness, without problems or ills of any kind, always progressing in the Father's kingdom. We are stuck because we see nothing but what surrounds us on the physical plane, in vain, planetary leaders, ascended masters, cosmic hosts and angels are ready to pour out all the fluids, all the light that is not needed to elevate our planet if we do not open the door to them. Permission must come from our own octave. If it does not come, not even God himself can intervene because he cannot violate his own law of free will. This little book was designed to reveal everything that Master Saint-Germain has strived to do to bring us to the culmination of ascension to the initiation of the planet. For those who are not pure enough to live with their brothers in the orbit of Uranus and the proximity of Venus, they will be demoted to a subhuman planet. Let us do what is in our power to help clean up the effluvium, brothers. Let us do the following three times a day for five minutes. In the name of the beloved presence I am, I invoke the liberating violet flame to envelop and illuminate every electron that comprises the planet Earth and all its incarnated inhabitants, until all is pure and radiant. Thank you, Father, for hearing me. Visualize the violet flame first enveloping your own body, then your home, neighborhood, city, country, continent, and the entire planet. Let us help save our youth and our brothers. May the light envelop advanced metaphysical students and it is recommended for them to read The Book of Gold of Saint-Germain, which contains transcendent revelations from the Master.